Hi guys, uh, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I am a consultant cardiologist and I work in York Hospital. And today I wanted to do a little video on the subject of why clot forms in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, now, uh, I was on the Health Unlocked website today and someone asked the question, someone uh, raised a question and the question was entitled, the question nobody can seem to answer. And the poster, Dave, has asked that uh, he said, well, if you have one episode of AF, your stroke risk is greatly increased. If the mechanism is, if the purported mechanism is correct, i.e. a small blood clot can form in a small pocket in the atrium and then get pumped out to the brain at a later date, how come the risk isn't greater for people coming in and out of AF frequently? And apparently there's no evidence for that. And how come if you had one episode as time passes, surely that clot would be broken down? Nothing remains unchanged in your body for years, surely. Also, I suspect almost all of the population have at least had one episode in their lifetime, which would be the whole population, which would mean that the whole population has five times the risk, which would mean we would all have the same risk. So um, that was a really interesting question, and I thought I'd answer it. And in particular, it's particularly relevant to me because I put a video out a few weeks ago talking about why I didn't think AF causes strokes. I completely accept that AF is associated with strokes, but I don't think AF causes strokes. And um, a lot of people wrote back and said, look, but you know, what about this business? Because we thought it was the pooling of blood in AF that caused the stroke. So the first thing to understand is this, that there is no doubt that AF is associated with increased risk of strokes, okay? Uh, now, the mechanism used to be thought uh, to be that in because we had observed that patients who had AF were more likely to have strokes, we had to think of a mechanism by which that happened. And uh, we and the general consensus at that time was that because in AF, the atria, the top two chambers, are not pumping effectively, the blood within the atria stagnates. And that stagnation is particularly prevalent in these beak-shaped structures on the side of the atria called the left atrial, append the atrial appendages. So particularly in the left atrial appendage, people worry that because the blood in the atria isn't being moved, that blood can stagnate and form a blood clot. Undoubtedly true. Um, and that can happen. And we know from studies where they've done things like TOEs, where they actually pop a probe down and have a look at the heart from the back, that clot does form in that situation. However, um, so that was the initial thought process, okay? But then came some interesting studies, and in particular, I'm referring to a study by Bernard Gersh. Uh, and that study was done in patients who had atrial fibrillation, either atrial fibrillation all the time, or patients who were going in and out of atrial fibrillation. But there was something very special about these patients. These patients were generally young, under the age of 60, and these patients were otherwise completely well. They did not suffer from diabetes. They did not have high blood pressure. They did not have heart failure. They did not have any vascular disease. They were just generally well people. Okay. And Professor Gersh followed these people up over 15 years and found that they didn't have strokes. So then you had to, then we were faced with the scenario that you have to explain that. If you think that it's the atrial fibrillation and the stagnation of blood in atrial fibrillation, which is causing the clot formation which causes the strokes, then why were these people who were exactly the same, uh, who had exactly the same condition, not having the strokes? Why were these people who were in AF or were going in and out of AF not having the strokes? Um, and <clears throat> so, so it is because of this we then have to rethink our theory. We have to rethink the mechanism uh, because studies like this inform us and they allow us to then go back and go back to the drawing board and say well why is that what we have found is that actually if you have af on its own with no comorbidities you don't get strokes if you have af with lots of comorbidities high blood pressure diabetes old age etc you get strokes so it can't just be the af it can't just be about stagnation of blood otherwise Everyone with AF should have strokes, right? So um, you have to then go back to try and understand why clot forms. 
And if you understand why clot forms, you'll be able to then work out why uh, people who have AF and comorbidities have strokes and why people who have AF without comorbidities don't. So clot forms because of three reasons, okay? And these three uh, causes were described by Professor Rudolf Virchow, Rudolf Virchow, and he described this thing called the Virchow triad. So he said, number one, okay, if blood doesn't move, it is more likely to clot. Okay, I agree that completely stagnation of blood will cause blood to clot, number one. Number two, if your blood is in some way hypercoagulable, i.e. thicker and more likely to clot because there's an abnormality with it, then it's more likely to clot. Okay, so if you have a clotting problem, which makes your blood more likely to clot, then your blood is more likely to clot. Dehydration is another thing because when you're dehydrated, your blood is in a sense thicker and therefore you're more likely to clot. And number three is that if the vessel in which the blood is traveling is in some way damaged, then that affects the flow of blood and affects the streamlined flow of blood and this can also cause the blood to clot. All right. And where you have just one, your risk is increased, but not hugely so. But when you have a combination of these three factors, then your risk for forming clot is much, much greater. Now, let's look at, we worry about strokes uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation, but let's look at patients who have high blood pressure. Okay, They've ne they don't, if you take a group of people who have never had atrial fibrillation but simply suffer from high blood pressure, their risk of stroke is huge. Now, 50% of all strokes are caused by high blood pressure. But there is no stagnation in patients with high blood pressure. If you ha There is no stasis of blood in them. But what there is, is there is vessel wall injury. So in those patients, when the blood is traveling because the arteries get hardened, the streamlined flow of blood gets affected, and that makes it more likely for the blood to clot. And that's why you see strokes in patients with high blood pressure. Let's look at diabetes. In diabetes, two things happen. Your vessel wall gets damaged and your blood becomes more hypercoagulable. And therefore, diabetics, the risk of stroke is doubled in diabetics. Okay? And no stagnation in diabetics. Look at old age. The biggest risk factor for strokes when it comes to, you know, the CHADS 2 vast scoring system. What happens in old age? Your blood becomes more, it becomes hypercoagulable, your vessels get hardened, and you become more sedentary, and therefore there is more stasis, and therefore a significantly higher risk of strokes. So what I'm trying to say is that it is the, it is the additional two factors in the triad that the comorbidities bring into the AF equation. So although, yes, you have AF, and you have some stagnation of blood, that stagnation of blood is probably not all that is required for the clot to form and cause strokes. But if you have vessel wall injury, particularly in the brain, where the brain is, so blood vessels are, uh, are hardened in the brain, if you have hypercoagulability, then that in combination with the stagnation will increase your risk substantially. And what brings in these two additional factors? Diabetes does, high blood pressure does, age does, heart failure. In heart failure, you get stagnation, you get coagulability, you get, uh, you get inflammation. So you can sometimes, you know, so heart failure brings in more stagnation of blood in addition to atrial fibrillation. Women, if you take women, women have more strokes than men, regardless of whether they've ever had AF or not. So the hormones uh, associated in women affect coagulability and that brings in the risk of increases that risk of stroke um, so that is why the comorbidities are so important because they introduce two other factors in the clotting in the in Virchow's triad which in combination with the stagnation is what substantially increases the stroke risk stagnation on its own probably doesn't do as much and that is why people talk about anticoagulating those patients who have a high CHADS2 VASC score. Remember, being in AF is not part of the CHADS2 VASC score. It is age, 
It is diabetes. It is high blood pressure. It is heart failure. It is previous stroke. It is vascular disease. Vascular disease meaning blood vessel wall disease, disease of the walls. Again, an important uh, member of the triad of the triad described by Professor Ver Verchow. So I hope this clarifies why people develop strokes in atrial fibrillation. I don't think it's just about the pooling of blood, but I do think that the pooling in addition to other factors uh, from the triad uh, increase the risk of clots substantially. So I hope this was uh, useful. Um, I'm going to try and put out another video on uh, Saturday and I'm going to try and do either one or two videos per week. Uh, please um, uh, feel free to come and join me on my Facebook page. Um, please feel free to leave me a message or send me a message. Um, my um, website is www.yorkcardiology.co.uk and my Facebook page is yorkcardiology at gmail.com, which is also incidentally my email address. So um, thank you so much for listening and all the best. Take care. Bye.